Hey, what's up? Mr. Bill here. I just wanted to plug some dates before you listen to the podcast. I'm playing on December 12th in San Francisco, 13th in Nevada City, 14th LA, 18th Denver, 19th Santa Fe, 21st Columbus. In January, I'm playing the 11th in Philly, 17th in Montreal, 18th in Providence, 24th in Pontiac. Uh, I have an EP out on my own label, Believe or Beats, called the IDM EP. I have collabs on there with G-Space, Ulusile, Woolg, and Funny, and you can find the links for that on any of my social media, basically. Um, if you're listening to this podcast, make sure to rate and comment on the Apple Podcast app. Apparently, it helps us a lot. And also, if you go to the show notes for this episode, uh, there's a link to my Discord channel, and you should join it and ask some questions there so I can uh, address those questions in future episodes with future guests. Uh, thanks. Enjoy the episode. Hey, you're listening to the Mr. Bill Podcast. Hey, you're listening to the Mr. Bill Podcast. Hey, you are listening to the Mr. Bill Podcast. Hey, you're 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 listening to the Mr. Bill Podcast. Fuck yeah, man. Well, welcome to the Mr. Bill podcast. Yeah, man. Thanks for coming on. Thanks for having me, dude. Yeah, of course. Um, I'm actually not super familiar with your project. Um, I've listened to a few tunes. I listened to the the EP you did on Deep, Dark, and Dangerous, which was, um, what's that, Truth label, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, those guys are sick. I really like their music. I actually really like their sets. They're, like, fun to listen to. Yeah, yeah, they're cool. And uh, I don't know, have you seen both of them play or like either like they have different styles so like yeah tristan plays like a much different set than dre so if you ever see them like separately um it's it's kind of cool but then like when they're together they have like a really nice blend and 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 it works well and and it kind of like reflects in their music too Uh, how would you like describe the difference between a tristan set and a dre set (sighs) dre and i think well like i said like i think this like is is true in like their their writing of music too dre tends to have kind of the more um aggressive uh kind of um mean dark dangerous (laughs) Uh, i'm paid to say that uh kind of the more dangerous kind of dark sound like that Uh and then i think tristan really kills it with like the melodies and 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 so when they're playing live um, Tristan sets, I think are a little bit more spaced out and, and I think he tends to play a little bit more of the melodic songs and then Dre's sets tend to be more just energetic and, and. Okay. I think I know why that might be. I think it's probably because Tristan lives in New Zealand and Dre lives in America, right? Go on. Well, I think like, um, I notice when I spend a lot of, because I'm Australian, right? right so yeah. I notice when I spend a lot of time in Australia or pretty much anywhere else, my sets will become like softer and my like writing style will become softer and like everything about my music will become like just a little bit softer and a little bit more progressive. Really? And yeah, totally. Like, I mean, I started out as an IDM glitch artist and right. then moved to America and basically became a fucking rhythm artist. So like, <laughs> I never thought about it like that. Yeah. So, so when you play shows over there. Is that like you're just saying like the crowd reaction, like like they're more into the Yeah. So I was just over in Australia, right? And um and I just played a bunch of uh sets and almost after every set people were like it was way too heavy for me because I was just playing the same type of set as I would play in America. Really? Yeah. And I think like probably because Tristan is over there, he's like more exposed to that sort of appreciation of more progressive yeah. style and stuff like that. So when he comes over here, he just does that as well. Yeah. I and I feel like that. Dre's been living in LA now for a bunch of years. Yeah. So. Yeah. I mean, he's been touring the U S for what seems like, um, I mean, he, he's, he was like the, like they, but when they both came over when they first got it, you know, when they first started coming over and playing shows here, um, I think Dre just like fell in love with it and has pretty much lived in the U S since. <laughs> yeah. Um, that's a good place. And, if you're into electronic music, it's much bigger than anywhere else on the, in the planet. Yeah. Well, that's what all the like UK dubstep guys tell me is like, they, they all love coming over here to tour because they can come over here on like a two or three week tour yep. and play a show almost every night. Yep. Whereas in the UK, they're playing maybe one show a month. You yeah. Know, yeah there's not a real circuit there like there is here right um yeah. same in australia there's not like a circuit there really yeah you can do like Cairns, brisbane canberra sydney melbourne hobart maybe perth like there's like six cities 
do they do like are there a lot of like weekly or like monthly events there not really. No, I mean, there, there might be now in like Sydney and, and Melbourne and like the bigger cities, maybe for shit like, you know, dubstep and house and stuff like that. Yeah. But definitely not for like the more bespoke and like, you know, boutique, like, you know, deeper shit and you know, more progressive stuff. Because, yeah, in the UK, there's like, that doesn't exist. They, there's no such thing as, as weekly events, yeah. Or yeah. events really. Uh, well, that's, I, I think like a lot of that comes down to like economics, right? Like, in, in America, there's like a lot of reward for, for having a weekly event because as a promoter, you can make a lot of money doing that. And then your whole job can just be going to shows and like, sure, sure like during the week, you have to email people and like figure out who's going to play the show in three or four weeks time or however long. Mm -hmm. Then you have to do a bunch of promotion and all that kind of stuff. But like for the most part, that's still a pretty decent job. Whereas like I, I feel like in, in places like Australia or UK or maybe even parts of Europe, trying to put on a weekly it just becomes more risky than anything whereas in america it's like not that risky i feel like why do you think it's different there though just the people are different i think like if people in america are just down man like they're just keen to go and party all the time no wooks over there <laughs> yeah there's not enough wooks <laughs> that's the problem <laughs> there's, there's Interesting. More wooks. yeah well I've, I've have you ever been over to europe uh, so I spent the first few months of this year in Spain. Okay. Um, yeah. But I was just teaching at Berkeley, so oh, I was like nice. teaching a master's degree yeah. over there. Is, you, is that what uh, Incanti? Elisha? Elisha is currently doing that. Yeah, yeah. that's right. the exact same job I was doing. Um, nice. So, do you know Incanti from Zebler and Conti Experience? I mean, yeah, I know. Yeah, I know. Oh, I you know of him. No, yeah, of course. <clears throat> yeah, well, uh, he's playing the show next week. In uh, right, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah so, um, for those listening, if this is out, I, th I think this will be out before I play that show. I'm playing in Nevada City. Come, come to the fucking show. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So Ben in uh he developed like the whole masters program for electronic music there. And he wanted to take some time off at the start of the year, so I did that. But I didn't do any shows there. And, and pretty much what I gathered from being there was. Uh, everyone there is just into like house music and shit yeah and, and like uh moon and stuff <laughs> yeah yeah it's definitely more clubby clubby kind of thing in in europe from what i've seen <clears throat> yeah certainly i think um yeah i don't really think dubstep is a big thing there at all am i too quiet for your mic oh <laughs> uh, it's okay i'll keep adjusting it and just like i don't know the guy who like edits it will figure it out <laughs> right, i lost a little bit of my voice last night oh uh, yeah I don't, I don't get out much so <laughs> yeah how did the how did the show go last night was it sold out yeah yeah nice. sold out um i love the black box man it's like somebody like uh, i wouldn't consider myself a big artist and i wouldn't consider you a big artist but it's like mid-tier like smaller electronic music artists can go into the black box and just bam it just sells out yeah i, awesome. I think um I think that size is just like probably my favorite size to play. It's me too. Yeah. Like 350 um, or like 300. I, th I think it's like, yeah, 350 and sometimes th they go a little bit over. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, it's, it's right around there. And, um, cause they have the two rooms, it gets a little bit complicated, but yeah, when that, when that main room is packed out, it's just like, that's, I mean, the sound in there obviously is, is as good as it gets for an indoor venue, Dude, I think. So good, yeah. And then when it packs out with people, the sound gets even better. Cause it's, you know, all soaked up really nice. And, and it just, it's the vibes can just be unreal in that place. Totally. And like, I mean, don't get me wrong. Like the bigger shows are fun for sure. Like it's, it's, it's like a, you know, crazy experience, to like look out and see a big crowd but you feel way like more disconnected and uh, I get like, like really like, like I have a hard time like reading a, a crowd like that. Whereas like, you know, in a, in a venue like the black box, it's just like, you can hear every single person around you and, and just um, you can, you can read really what's working, what's not working. And to be fair, like that's a place where everything seems to work. I mean, people are super open, open-minded there. Yeah. Um, you know, some venues, <laughs> you know, I play, like pretty strictly dubstep sets, but you know, like dubstep can be really different. There's, you know, obviously like, you know, I can play a really deep set or a really aggro set. And, uh, and then my aggro set is like a deep set for a lot of people. So right, okay. it all changes, but then I go to some venues and like, I drop a deep song and like the place just stands still. I'm like, oh shit. <laughs> and then other places that song will just go off. Like it's, it's crazy how, how different that is. Yeah. Um, what do you think like the cutoff point is for, um, like amount of people before you sort of stop noticing the difference before i stop noticing the difference yeah i mean like so for instance you play to like two people and that feels bad and awkward. it doesn't feel good it doesn't feel good <laughs> you play to like 100 people or whatever and like that feels a bit better 
but then playing to like 300 definitely feels better than that but like there's got to be a cutoff right where it can't feel much better to play like between say 5,000 and 8,000 people I don't think I'd notice yeah so I mean yeah probably the biggest I've played is is around five or six I've I've had a few shows like that I did the bass nectar thing and and had a few sets uh I'm way more nervous for the like 10 people, 20 people Dude, shows. Yeah, same. Like, I, like that gives me anxiety. Yeah, yeah. Like, when I get up there and it's like, oh shit, it's a, it, this is a dead night, you know, bad turnout. Or, or sometimes you go places and it's like, it's like a bar scene where like, they don't even really know, like, they just think you're some, like, local, you know, like, DJ walking in and playing yeah, for, you know, they it. don't really get that you're, like, you, yeah. know, you know, and uh, I get really nervous for those. Like, I, I, I get, like, anxiety for those shows mm-hmm. and just, like, stand up there, like, really timid the whole time. Um, and then, like, not to say I don't get nervous for bigger shows. I do, but, like, I, it's way more comfortable for me, you know, when there's a ton of people. But I would say probably, like, five, six hundred is when it starts getting less fun maybe um, okay so you think like 500 is the sweet to, spot three to 500 is really nice mm-hmm. it does depend on the venue for sure yeah um i feel like festivals can be bigger and still be fun mm-hmm. um but yeah it is it is weird how that works because like you would just think like oh you know when you're starting off it's like you know, the first time you get like a hundred people, you're like, damn, this is sick. Yeah, this like, is oh, really, imagine 10,000. cracking, <laughs> right, right. And you just yeah. think, and then you get 200 people, you know, and then like, as you grow and you start playing bigger shows, like it gets more and more fun. But then, yeah, it does, it does reach like this kind of tipping point where, where it gets worse. And I don't know what that is. I, I think it's just, you know, uh, with that many people, it's just hard to, uh, I don't know. I don't really know what it is. Yeah. Any ideas? <laughs> no, um, I do know uh, that apparently uh, the amount of like things that a human can see and like tell how many there are without using numbers is like four or something like that. Like if I put like four objects on the table, like, you know, I don't have to look to know that that's, four. yeah, like that's right. four. But as soon as I start putting like five or six or more objects, it's five, but yeah, it is now. Well, depends if you count the keyboard at six, yeah. but like at some point, like you have to start using numbers to like count it. Right. And also yeah, yeah, yeah. apparently the amount of objects that like a human can tell before they start using numbers is about the same as a crow. Which is like interesting. four or something. I know this because my girlfriend told me. I don't. I say it was super random. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm not smart. Interesting knowledge. <laughs> but like, I think like um, like maybe the human thing could be somewhat related to that. It could also be maybe re- related to something like Dunbar's number, like which is the uh, I don't know. I think it's like some theory from tribal living or something where they uh, the theory is pretty much like you can only have like ever. 200 right like meaningful relationships in your life yeah somewhere. i've heard about that yeah like, you know a certain amount of friends like you can only have a certain amount of like close friends yeah before you just start and like, if not, you start making more beyond that you'll lose some of the or you know yeah <laughs> yeah you'll knock out some old friends yeah. so that's, that's probably yeah that's that's probably like i don't know if that's that related it maybe it might be um, yeah. i mean to be fair you know i've never done like i obviously never played you know like a Thirty thousand seat, you know, arena or something like. We did that's first awesome. bank, right? I did first bank, yeah, which is pretty big. That's like eight, seven thousand or something, seven or eight, something like that. Yeah, and it, I was the first DJ, so it wasn't like totally filled up yet. But yeah, that was that was that was pretty wild. Just to like look out and see that big of an arena. Um, probably one of the funnest sets I ever played was Costa Rica at Envision Festival, mm-hmm. um, and that was like I think about four or five thousand, and that like that was a big crowd, but like the vibes felt really good. And like it, like I could really see that the crowd was into it. Mm -hmm. Um, whereas like first bank, because of just the way the lighting is or whatever, like I just, I couldn't really see anything at all. I could see like some people in the front row and that's about it. So I think that's a part of it too. Yeah. That's Um, the thing is yeah, when when you're on a big stage like that, there's a fucking shitloads of light in your face. Yeah, sure. It's kind of got those stadium vibes. Yeah. Yeah. It becomes hard to see anything for sure. But you know, I, I wonder like, you know, some of those guys playing these like massive, massive shows. I mean, that's gotta be pretty exhilarating just for what it is. I mean, just looking out, I mean, just seeing that many people is crazy. <laughs> yeah. The biggest show I ever played was, um, with KJ Sorka in, uh, uh t- the Tacoma dome in, uh, Tacoma. Oh yeah. <laughs> and, um, that was lucky festival. Okay. And that was pretty sick. That was like, I think only about 5,000, but it was super fun. Yeah. <clears throat> um, so you said you're from Nevada city. Yeah, that's where I live now. I'm I'm from that area though. Nor- Northern California is where uh where I spent most of my life. I uh 
I've also lived right after high school. I lived in Hawaii for two years. Oh, cool. Whereabouts? Uh, I lived on Maui. Okay, cool. I was uh, I used to be really into windsurfing. Sweet. Um, and uh, when I finished high school, I like kind of was in a place where I was like, do I go to college and just do the really standard thing, or do I just kind of pursue this life of windsurfing? Um, you know, I say the word professionally, but like, you know, in order for it to be professional, you need to earn money. Yeah, right. And yeah, I, was, you, um, I was working like almost 40 hours a week. I was making, I mean, I was making a little bit of money from windsurfing. Yeah. Like, you know, I had some sponsors and like with sponsorship, a lot of it's like very just uh, deal based where like, you know, I would just get a certain amount of money for like a certain size picture in a magazine. And if it was like a full page, you get more. And if it's a half page, you get, you know, so there's all these like incentives and stuff. But the reality is that like, I, you know, I wasn't doing enough to really make it a full-time job. And when I lived out there, I started hanging out with all these other, you know, guys who were doing it professionally and, and doing the world tour and stuff. And, you know, it's a pretty small sport. Not many people even really know what windsurfing is. Yeah, yeah. And so as you can imagine, there's not a ton of money in the sport. And I started learning that even the guys who were like at the top of the world were making like almost minimum wage or they were making yeah, like well. 40, 40 grand a year or something like that. Oh, um, Wait, so what is windsurfing? This way you <laughs> you're on a surfboard and you have a kite basically, right? No. So that's kite kiteboarding kiteboarding okay um kiteboarding is when you have the kite and you're on like a wakeboard okay windsurfing is uh you have like a sail uh it looks more like a sailboat it kind of looks like a sailboat that you would stand on the board's like the size of a large surfboard and then you kind of hold on to the sail um and it was like i mean it was really fun like it was something i mean i I didn't get into it because i saw windsurfing was like i want to do that it was something my parents did it was like that's what they did that's what we did on family vacation basically right and so i got into it as a kid because i was just at the beach around them and doing it and then uh you know because there's not many people doing it i got (laughs) you know pretty pretty good at it uh for my age and uh and kind of went down that path for a bit but then just uh i was getting injured a lot and And like I said, when I learned that there's really no long-term career in it, I was like, I don't know if this is like something I really want to pursue full-time. So then after Hawaii, I moved to Oregon for a little bit. Um, Just as kind of like a, it was a cool place. There was windsurfing there, which is what brought me there. But then uh, I kind of just started losing interest in it there. And, uh, and then landed in Santa Cruz, which is where like things kind of really started for me, like. I feel like there was like this weird gap in my life between high school and Santa Cruz where I was like kind of trying this windsurfing thing. And then it just like, wasn't really working out. And so then when I went to Santa Cruz, um, that's when I kind of felt like I was starting my like real post high school, like life. Mm -hmm. And that's, uh, that's where I got into music. Nice. Um, man. Cool. Yeah. yeah. Santa Cruz is great. I was there um, recently. Yeah. I love it. A few months ago. It was awesome. Yeah. Really good music scene. Um, really fun culture there. Uh, mm-hmm. obviously when you're a 20 year old kid, that's like just the place to be. Yeah. And I had a ton of friends there cause I grew up about three hours from Santa Cruz and that was like one of the main colleges that everyone from my town went to like a huge chunk of my high school went there. So when I moved there, I already had a ton of friends, um, that I'd known from high school that were there, you know, in college and, um, some not in college and, uh, <laughs> it was a fun place to party and, 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 learn about uh you know electronic music and dubstep which is like something that was totally foreign to me at the time yeah right interesting uh, so you, you got into dubstep what how long ago so that i moved there in 2009 and um i feel like that's when dubstep was popping too like yeah it was good well and just like dubstep but also just like the like west coast bass thing was just kind of starting to take off then so like yeah, the whole, i would like, see area shit yeah and so like what what really kind of got me into it was like you know, we'd go to these, like they'd throw these renegade shows and I had like, some of my friends were like part of the guys who would bring out the sound system and, you know, the decks and we'd set up at like one in the morning out in some, you know, f- you know, federal land or something that we definitely should not have been there. And, uh, did you remember a party that happened called, uh, I think it was called like frosty f- fractal uh, forest fractal forest this one yep or frost yep. yeah was, was that it i think that was it or frosty fractals maybe or something frosty, yeah something like that i don't know it was the one i that, didn't go to it it was put on by um by the wormhole guys right yeah that was like one of the first shows i ever played here okay yeah um, that was interesting yeah so basically i like um yeah so wh- this was before they started the wormhole weekly thing but i rocked up in i want to say 
I don't know, San Francisco, I think. And then they picked me up from there and drove me like a few hours to Santa Cruz. And then once we got to the site, it was all raining and muddy and stuff. So you couldn't like actually drive into the thing. Right. So there was this one guy who was like having to like sort of trip everyone down to the <laughs> to the party down this like big muddy road thing. And he just yeah. had a four wheel drive. And he was like some redneck guy. Yeah. And he, he came and picked me up in the thing. So this was like one of my first... Um, uh, depictions of like what an American party was like and pretty much he picked me up and he's like check this out and like opened his glove box and there's just a gun in his glove box and then he's just Welcome like New America yeah and then he's just hammering it down this mud road <laughs> down to this party and then we shot the gun at a tree and like <laughs> that's America that's it yeah yeah, yeah. It, was, it was fucking weird but yeah it was um, super fun I think actually G. Jones and Bleep Bloop all played that too yeah uh was it G Jones then? Because I was gonna say I remember uh, it might have been it was Grizzly J. Grizzly J. When I been. first like heard about him, and yeah, him and like Minnesota were like playing like these like college parties basically, and they were like they were like the headliners of like the Renegades, right. um, and it would just be like yeah, like maybe a hundred people all just like stupid high on drugs and <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. Those were, those were funny. Those were funny parties. And, and there's definitely some nostalgia. Like I do kind of miss that like thing, which I, I'm, I assume people are still doing renegades out there, but I haven't done that in a while, but that was like a fun, yeah, that was a fun way of doing it, but very different from like, I think the classic rave scene where you would like go to a warehouse. Like there was something about being out in the forest that was, that was, I think kind of special and yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, so what are you doing in Nevada city now? Or grass uh, valley. Why do they call it Grass Valley? Is it just because of weed? Uh, probably not. But yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I don't, okay. yeah, I don't know the origins of that. But uh, there's a lot of weed there. Yeah, Grass Valley, Nevada City. Um, and then yeah, I live I live kind of between Auburn and Grass Valley. And I uh, <clears throat> I moved out there a few years ago because. I've been living in Santa Cruz and then I moved to my hometown. I moved back to my hometown, uh, Davis because I wanted to get more serious about school. Mm -hmm. I was like, okay, I'm in like I'm in my like twenties. Like I, th I think I was probably like 23 or something like that. 22, 23. And I was like, yeah, I need to like go to school. Like I, you know, I'm just kind of fucking around and I was, I was doing a community college in Santa Cruz, but I was like, I was just, screwing around. I had no idea what I was doing. I was like, I was changing my major every semester and just like taking classes that seemed fun. And so, yeah, I moved back to Davis cause I was like, I need to, yeah, I need to like get more serious about like, you know, my future, I guess. Um, and actually my, my, uh, my girlfriend had, had finished, uh, she, she'd finished school at UC Santa Cruz as well. So it was just kind of like a good time to leave Santa Cruz. So we went to Davis, but like Davis was just kind of boring for us. We lived there for a couple of years, but we're just like, it was, it was, it was just, yeah, it was, you know, hometown. Like you just, I didn't want to be there that long. So then we were like, well, like, where could we move? That's affordable. Um, that's kind of like, you know, cause we both love Santa Cruz, but that place is so expensive to live. And oh, right. Is it like more expensive than the Bay? I don't know about more, but it's, it's a lot. Like we were paying like 1500 for a two bedroom apartment. Oh, um, that seems like pretty normal. That's probably normal for Denver too. I would. Well, say. I, I guess that's normal, but like, um, I mean, we were, we were wanting to like get a house together. Mm -hmm. Like we were wanting, we were wanting more space. I mean, that was for an apartment. I guess that's the main yeah, thing. Yeah. It was like 1500 for an apartment, which is not like crazy, but like we didn't want to live in apartments anymore. Yeah, okay, we were like, we want to like live in a house. We have some dogs. Like yeah. we just want like some space. Especially um, if you like got a studio too. Yeah. You don't yeah. want to have like floors where people can hear you through the floors and shit. Right. And so I got a question for you. So we're sitting yeah. in this really nice studio. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but this is not your house. This is like rented studio space. Yeah. I have a separate apartment, like pretty close to here. How does that work for you? Uh, I'm very curious about the idea, like the difference between having your studio or, your, or just in your house, whether it's your little laptop or whatever, or like yeah. having a separate space that you go to work. <clears throat> yeah. So, um, there's like, bits uh, there's there's pros and cons i think i think as far as writing goes there's more cons to having your studio separate from your house because it's nice to be able to like just get an idea and then be like bam i'm in the studio already right that's right. why i feel like i could never do it yeah so that's one thing that i miss but i'm actually changing that real soon 
Um, so I don't like that about it because sometimes I'll be home. I'll be like, oh shit, I got a good idea. And then I'll basically just convince myself that the idea is not good because I can't be bothered coming to the studio. Mm -hmm. Um, so I'll be like, oh, it's fine. If I remember it, it's a good idea. And if I don't remember it, which I probably won't, fuck it. Do you not have like a laptop at home that you just quickly like bang out an idea? Like, yeah, I do actually. Mini notes just to remember like what you were going for or something or. Yeah. And sometimes I do that, but, um, the, the plus side to having a studio like this is, well, obviously it's a bigger space like room wise than any room in my apartment. Um, so you get better acoustics with a bigger room generally, uh, especially with a high ceiling. Mm -hmm. Um, the problem with building, uh, in houses a lot of the time is the ceilings are always nine feet tall. Yeah. Um, This is, this is taller than normal ceiling, huh? Yeah. I think this is 12 okay, or 10, 10 and a half or something. So when you get a nine foot ceiling, you always get a standing wave pretty much at about a hundred Hertz. Right. Um, I don't know. I think it's just like the maths works out that way to create some resonance there. Mm -hmm. You can fix it with clouds and stuff like that. But, um, generally there's just always this annoying like hum in the low end. That's hard, really hard to get rid of in bedrooms. So that's a pro to having a separate space like this with a high roof and stuff like that. Um, also just the fact that like, if I'm doing a session with like multiple people, it's a bigger room and it's like, you know, inviting people here if they're like a, some professional client or something that like feels more pro or some shit. Oh yeah, definitely. Um, yeah. So there's some pros, but definitely, um, so, so like I said, I'm moving to, to San Francisco at the start of 2020, mm-hmm. um, and just it was way too expensive there to even oh, yeah. fathom fucking oh, yeah. having two spaces. Yeah. It's almost too <laughs> expensive to have one. Space. That's right. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So I'm so I'm gonna just uh, have one space there, and basically my studio is gonna be in the lounge room, and I'm gonna have a bedroom in the house, and I'll be living with a few other people. Okay. Um, which I'm actually kind of excited for because I like the idea of uh, having the studio at the house again, where I can just sort of. I don't know. Like I said, do you know Squanto? He's like a dubstep guy. I, yeah, totally. I don't know him personally, but I totally know who he is. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. So I just spent a week with him in Utah a few weeks ago, just working on tunes. And he's he has like just a bedroom and a studio. And I was just like sleeping in, in the lounge room on like a blow up mattress and shit. And it was fucking awesome. It was like, we'd just wake up, fucking he'd smoke weed. I'd make coffee. We'd just like eat some food. And then we're already in the studio, you know, like, yeah. For me, yeah. it's kind of like it, I'll be at home and I'll be like, all right, when am I going to go to the studio today? And sometimes it'll take me like three or four hours of just fucking around at home. Like I'll put some laundry on, I'll like make breakfast, I'll have coffee, I'll answer some emails. And like by the time I've done all of that shit, it's like I'm still not at the studio. Like whereas I could almost be passively making music as I was doing all of that right. stuff if my studio was just at home. Do you ever get like anxiety about going to the studio to work on music? No, I don't get that. And I also don't get writer's block or anything like that. So weird um, flex. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's cool. Yeah, no, no, I, I don't have a lot of anxiety yeah. around writing music at all. So yeah. I, I don't get like a ton of anxiety necessarily, like, but I do. Like once I like once I'm like, as soon as I start working on something, I'm fine. Which is why I just force myself to start all the time. Like I just force yeah. myself into it. But I do sometimes get like anxiety when I'm going to work on music, and I like start getting like anxious about like actually the starting like starting because it's so intimidating especially like when you're like wanting to start a new tune and it's like really overwhelming it's like okay here we go like this is gonna be a long time i'm gonna put into this and it might just suck in the end yeah see i don't think about it like that the way i think about writing music is i'm just like i'm gonna open up a project file and i'm just gonna start fucking with stuff yeah and if a song starts to happen cool but if not like i just have an idea that like i just want to test something in a synth or something right like i just want to see like how this filter works or like you know what if i modulate a thing this way i've never thought to do that before and i'll just like start with that kind of mentality of just like doing whatever just like fucking around and then usually by proxy of doing that eventually i'll go like oh that gives me an idea for a song and then i'll start like working on a song yeah i've i've definitely worked at getting better at just like not thinking about it as like i'm opening i work in fl studio like i don't think like i'm opening fl studio to make a song i i'm i'm i work really hard to like i've gotten better at just like i'm just gonna put i'm just gonna open it up and just make some sounds and kind of see where that goes and that definitely helps a lot with that (coughs) yeah i think Um, so like even if you just um open the thing up to be like i'm just gonna make samples you know like i'm just gonna make drums or i'm just gonna make basses yeah here's the thing is i like you need to do drum sessions right and you need to do bass design sessions and shit otherwise you end up sort of like getting stuck in the writing see i I don't and that's i think a big thing i need to yeah i start doing more 
Well, here's my problem with it is like I, I don't do it a lot. I should do it more. I probably do like one kick and snare session a month or maybe one every two or three and, months. And what is that? It's literally where I just sit down for half a day and just make kicks and snares. Half a day. Yeah, like just making – because I'll use those kicks and snares for the next six months. You're just you know? making your own sample packs. Yeah, exactly. And then I'll do the same with basses. But the problem I have with it is like as I'm – sort of doing this session i'll get like halfway through it like you know one hour into it or something and i'll just start making get a song idea. yeah <laughs> so, right i guess honestly that's probably one of the reasons i like the times i definitely don't make my own kicks and snares enough like at least from scratch i you know i i generally that's like like that that's something like i'll usually take a really generic one when i start an idea of a song and then once the song's starting to build then i'll like go back and actually like really craft the kick snare how i want it but i do try to like open fl and be like okay like i'm gonna make like some serum patches or something and yeah it like dude it goes for maybe like maybe 20 minutes i'll save like three different patches and then i'll land on one where i'm like oh wait what yeah, if i do this and then all of a sudden, and it's like there yeah whatever whatever you know session i was gonna have to make patches it's just yeah it never works out that well but i want to do yeah. that more because i one of the things that slows me down in production the most is getting into a tune and then just stopping for like two hours while I, you know, make a bass or, you know, do something like that, which I could have just done a long time ago, or even just sample hunting, you know, just digging through the packs that I have or digging online for stuff. I just like, will stop halfway through a tune to look for one thing. And then I just spend two hours doing something random. And then by the time I'm done with that, I don't even want to work on the tune anymore. And like, I, I recognize it would be much better if I just had that all ready to go. Cause the artists that I talk to that do that, you know, always tell me how beneficial it is. And I guess I just don't listen to them. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. I mean, another thing that can be beneficial is, um, just like file organization too. I'm the worst at it. Yeah. yeah me too, yeah. honestly. But it's like <laughs> something where if I'm not really feeling music that day or something, I'll just like start organizing shit, like you know, yeah. putting stuff in, better folders and naming shit neatly and just like getting my yeah. whole workspace looking nice again it's kind of like if you imagine it like a you know carpenter's workbench or something like that oh, it's yeah. like they just have shit all over the bench it's gonna be hard to like get anything done my so. bench is piled like two or three feet high of yeah. junk and <laughs> my sample packs are all just random shit and it is my it, i'm so unorganized it's it's terrible um and i honestly I, pr I probably like should spend a lot more time on that but I think in the same reason that like when I start making, you know, patches that I get distracted when I'm at my computer, I just like, it's so much more fun to like actually just work on like a beat, whether yeah. it's like going to turn into something cool or not. It's just so much more fun to do that than organize shit. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> totally. Well then in that case, like that could be a way to beat writer's block in the sense that you could like try to make yourself do something boring like that and then just procrastinate by making music. Yeah. I, I mean, to, to be fair, actually, I, I, I would say I'm pretty good about not really getting writer's block um, because I try not to think about, I just try not to think about it as writer's block. Mm -hmm. Well, okay. What I do, I think that, that kind of fights writer's block really well is I don't ever not turn on my computer because I'm feeling writer's block. Mm. So I'll definitely have times where I'm like, not really that inspired to make music, but I've learned over the years, the worst thing you can do is just not open your DAW because some of the best songs I've made came literally like at a, on a night when I was like about to turn my computer off and just like go play video games or something. And I just like do one thing. And then that just like, all it takes is that spark. Right. And then all of a sudden, you know, seven hours later, sun's coming up and I've like made one of the sickest tunes. And so because I've had that experience a few times, I've learned like the worst thing you can do if you're feeling writer's block, if you're feeling uninspired is just like not do it for a day. Mm -hmm. So I try and I don't stick to it always, but I try if I'm home every single day I'm home to at least turn on my computer and like, I don't set necessarily a time limit, but at least just like turn on my computer and try to make something or mm -hmm. try to fuck around with sounds. Um, and how much would you say you're home versus not home these days? Do you tour a lot or? Yeah, well, uh, it definitely depends. Like I, I was last fall, I did a really big tour of the Whittler. Uh, we did 43 shows in 12 weeks. Holy fuck. A lot. So like I was gone, we were basically coming, <coughs> we came home every week, but we'd be home like Monday and maybe Tuesday and then go back. Uh, so you're flying to all these shows, flying to every show. Holy shit. It was, it was 
a little bit overwhelming. Yeah, that's and a lot. by a little bit, I mean like it was very overwhelming. Yeah, it's a and, lot of flying. And it, yeah, it, it actually was like super draining. I got the flu like two weeks in, and that just made the like next like two or three weeks fucking hell. Um, but so yeah, so I was like last fall, I basically just had three months where I didn't even turn on my computer. Like I was coming home doing laundry like sleeping for an entire day and then just leaving again. Yeah, yeah. And that wasn't very healthy. I don't think, um, no, it's too much, but we're doing it again next spring. Okay. And <laughs> we're trying to have a few less dates, but it's already looking like it's probably going to be somewhere in that range again. I think, um, mental at that point, are you like getting decent fees for every show still? Or are you kind of like taking weird Tuesday night shows in Billings, Montana and shit? Uh, a little bit. Yeah. So, so, I mean, definitely like, you know, we're trying to like maximize our fees on the weekends. Um, and then, yeah, I think that's like, if I would say there was one thing we did wrong last year, it's that we did probably take too many of those just like tiny shows that just happened to be in the same kind of area. And it just worked out. And we were like, Oh, it's, yeah. you know, just, <laughs> you know, cause the thing is when you're booking it, not, not that we're necessarily doing the booking, but when our agents are booking it and, and you're like, Hey, like, you don't want to do this. And we're like, yeah, sure. Whatever. It you looks know, like, like it makes sense on paper. Right. But then right. when you're like fucking having to stay an extra day and like do another thing to like, you know, 50 or hundred people. Yeah. You're kind of like, you know what? I would forego however much money this is exactly. to be at home right now. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. So that was like, definitely like a priority. Like when we, when we started planning this next tour, um, which is going to be like basically the end of February until like the beginning of June, um, we were like, okay, oh, like shit, let's that's a long tour. That's not even a fucking spring tour. That's like a full blown end of winter into start of summer. Tour. Yeah. Let's see. Yeah. It's going to be like solid three months, but what we're, do I would say we're doing, it's going to be like the tour is going to be longer. It's going to take up more time, but we're having probably less shows in that time. So like the goal is that like, we're not just completely slammed like we were on the last time. And we're, we're turning down definitely some of those smaller gigs. Cause it's, yeah, it's too much. Um, but at least for this year, this year's definitely been a lighter year. Um, and I would say I'm home, you know, definitely during the summer, like doing the festival thing. It's like, you're gone pretty much every weekend, but then, you know, Monday through Thursday I'm home. And, and I usually always take like one day when I get home to just not work on music, any kind of a break. But then I, I get that itch, you know, a day or two later. And, um, I'm really stoked right now. I had all of November. I had one show in November and then the rest of the month off. And then, uh, I actually have like pretty much the next like two months, pretty, uh, almost completely off, uh, which I'm really stoked on. Uh, nice. cause I, I love just being home and making music. That's definitely like, so, you know, it's so much fun for me. It's so really is the goal in those two months to basically try and get a release together or just a bunch of tracks together for the spring tour? I, I prioritize just making playable tunes versus releases. Okay. Uh, probably tied into like, just like the general anxiety I'll get from just like, want, like, you know, just like finishing a tune. I just like, I don't like, I get like, it, it's really hard for me to like grind that last 10% of a tune I, for everyone. It's not like I'm special. Yeah. That. I have a theory. I think the last 10% is actually more like 50%. Oh, Dude, I could say even more than that probably sometimes. Yeah. Time yeah. Because wise. It's, yeah. yeah because like lengthwise to getting a tune to two and a half, three minutes long, you can do that in like a few hours, really. Sure. Yeah. But it's like getting all the polish done and the little fills and like just the yeah. little sweeps and effects bits and like fucking getting the mix down like fully nailed, which seems like you would say to someone, oh, yeah, this tune's like, you know, 80%, 90% there. But really, it's like 40% there because yeah. it's like all that extra, just the tiny shit takes so fucking long. Well, and then I, I, I don't know if it's the same for you, but it's like you just start questioning everything at that point. Like every single thing you add, you're like, does it actually make it better? Yeah, right. Does it actually make it better? And then like you'll spend like half a day working on something and at the end of the day, pretty much scrap everything you've done. Like sometimes, sometimes yeah. I'll spend an entire night, like trying to polish up a tune. And then at the end, I pretty much take away everything other than like one riser. I'm like, yeah, that's right. the only thing that actually like needs to stay. And so yeah, time-wise it can, it can take forever. So I, I, I prioritize, I mean, just in general, like I think, you know, for me, it's more fulfilling to just have a bunch of cool new beats to play out mm -hmm. when I'm playing shows than having like, polished releases and i probably um my polished releases probably suffer because of that because like i i i don't i don't spend enough time um perfecting my releases i usually like kind of my my what i've noticed the last like couple years at least um 
I basically will make a tune. Um, I, I usually have like, a, like when I get an idea for a song, I'll actually stop. Once I get like kind of the basic f- like flow, the basic kind of beat, I actually stop working on it. Even if I'm stoked on it, I stop and I like sit on it for a day. And then I come back to it. Then I like wait for like a night where I have like, okay, I can work on this all night. I have no, nothing planned or whatever. And then I go into it. So I get like maybe 30% of a tune, 40% of a tune. And then the next night I come in and really like make it bang. But then I get to that 80% mark. It's totally playable. It's going to be great live. I put on my USBs. I go out for the weekend. I start playing it. Sounds good. Does well. Maybe it doesn't, but when it does well, I'm like, cool, this is an awesome tune. I'm stoked on it. But then I never want to go back and finish that last 20%. Right. <laughs> and then it's not till like seven or eight months later that I'm kind of tired of playing it live. And I'm like, okay, I should probably release this now. And then I just feel like I have to like cram one or two nights of like that polishing. And so um, yeah. what ends up happening is I just, I make way more tunes than I finish. Um, which is again, like it's fulfilling for me because I can go out and play shows and play a ton of shit that no one's heard. Um, but then, you know, when it comes down to my releases, I wish, I wish I spent more time, um, perfecting them. But, you know, I also have tried to just recognize that at that point, like, is my time, is it more valuable to me to like get a release perfect or, just keep creating new ideas and cause that's way right. more fun. Cause it's me. like to get four tracks, maybe like totally locked and good to go for a release yeah. might take you like a month. Yeah. If it, even if they're all 80% done, I have three EPs right now, three, four track EPs right, right. that are like basically there. Mm-hmm. Honestly, one of them, I probably won't do anything between now and the time I send the pre-masters in like, seriously, like it's <laughs> like, but I'll just sit on it for like the next like two months. Yeah. You just got to like, make sure you're fine with it and just listen to it every day. And then all it's, all it takes is one day to just be like, fuck it. Like now, now I'll send in the pre-masters. I found that with a lot of tunes in the past too. Like I'll make it in like a, you know, eight hours or something or less sometimes like four hours. And I'll be like, oh, this tune's pretty sick, but like I didn't spend long enough on it. So like I don't really value it enough because I didn't invest enough effort into it. Totally. And then I'll like, go a year without even listening to it or anything and then i'll pull it out again i'll sort of forget how much effort i invested or anything and be like you know what this is pretty sick (laughs) yeah and then i'll just like throw it into a daw boost the highs a little bit and then put it out totally yeah and like i think we do like because i definitely do the same where like i i i i correlate like the time I spend on a tune to how good it is. Yeah. It's like almost value equals uh, effort equals sure. value or something like that. Yeah. Which yeah. is just like, which not is bullshit. really true. Yeah. Yeah. Like some of my sickest tunes I made pretty quick and then others that I wish I'd never released. I spent way too long on, you know, like yeah. there's definitely no, yeah, there's no correlation there. Um, but yeah, I mean, my, my general philosophy is just like, I want to be having fun. If it, if it gets to a point where it's really feeling like a grind, I think that's what, like, that's one of the reasons why when I get to that point, I'm just like, just release it. Like I, it's not fun to work on anymore. I'm not getting any like fulfillment. Out. It's not, it's just not enjoyable. Um, just put it out so that other people can hear it. And maybe it's not the best thing. Maybe I could have done better. You're, you're all, always going to be like, maybe I could have like made this song better, but it is what it is. And it was like, a you know, it captured a, a, you know, several hours of my life that I was really into that idea. And then, you know, a lot of people at that point, you know, they, they like get timid about releasing stuff, but I actually just like have, I feel like I'm pretty good at just being like, no, that's it. Like it is, it is what it is. It's not perfect. And, uh, I hope you like it. And that's yeah. kind of my attitude with releases. I also think um, with creating stuff in like a night or whatever or two days or whatever, I honestly sometimes feel like it's not like a large enough snapshot of like who I am musically. Okay, interesting. So, yeah, yeah, I'm like, you know, if I make something in one day, it's like maybe my influences on that day were skewed massively towards a certain style or whatever, which Mm -hmm. is probably a good thing because you don't want, you know, to make the same sounding thing every time. But like... um, I, I, I kind of feel like I need to work on it and then work on it again like a few months later and then a few months later and a few months later. So it takes like a larger snapshot of like my preferences musically. Interesting. You know, rather than do just taking make, like this do very you make big changes. Um 
some sometimes yeah like sometimes okay. i'll i'll stem it like i'll i'll get a try like could be like a 60 channel session uh -huh. and then i'll stem the whole thing out into like eight buses mm -hmm. and then just reload those eight buses into a new session just chop it all up and like fuck with it wow okay and, yeah, and i would say that's like the biggest change that i would do yeah like basically rearranging the whole thing and like re basically remixing my own tune sure yeah but then does that do you find that that often will lead to just the like when you go back at the end like at the end do you listen to that one and go i'm glad i'd like that actually is cooler than what the original idea was like do you find that that actually helps a lot um M most of the time yeah i'll i'll listen to the original version and be like oh yeah that's definitely like a shittier version of what i made out yeah. of that or like you know yeah i don't know sometimes i feel like uh john i, th I heard john hopkins say in an interview once he's like he said al almost every track he like has to build something beautiful and then like destroy it to make something like grow out of it. <laughs> okay. Yeah. It's, it's deep. That's yeah. 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 And I feel like that's kind of how I work a little bit too. Like I'll, yeah. I'll make something and it'll just be like too sterile or too, I don't know, clean or something like that. So I'll have to like destroy it in a certain way. And then a new thing can kind of grow out of it and be this more interesting, weirder sort of morphed version of a few things. Yeah, interesting. And I feel like that's really hard to do in a day because, like, oh, of course, you yeah. don't like have the sort of capacity to just like switch modes, like yeah. in your brain that that quick or whatever. I well, know uh, the Whittler, He uh, he does that a lot as well. He he a lot a lot of like a lot of his tunes were like Frankenstein things from other tunes where he would like go back and take pieces and then and uh yeah i don't do too much of that and and i wonder if part of it is just because i like worry that i'm like gonna fuck it or not fuck it up because you know obviously you always have that save project but i guess like i worry that i'm gonna spend a bunch of time for nothing i don't know maybe that's probably i probably should try that more um yeah do, so you, do you play those so i think that's a part of it too do you play those songs like so you have an idea. You said like a month later you'll work on it again. Are you playing it for that month? No, uh, not not all the time. Like quite often, I won't play a song until it's like. Uh, well, actually, I don't know. It's hard to say. It depends, it depends because true. a lot of the stuff I make isn't playable anyway. Like a lot of the stuff I make is too soft, I reckon, for sets. Oh, I see. So yeah, yeah it's okay. like too glitchy or too like down tempo y or it's not something you'd play live. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, right. Um, if it's a banger though, yeah, like I'll, I'll be playing it as okay. if I've got shows. I don't play that many shows. I play like, I mean, I've got seven shows this month or sorry, in, is it December? Yeah. Yep. I have seven shows in December. <laughs> um, and that's more than, that's way more than usual. Yeah. Like usually I'll, I'll have like one or two shows a month. Do you do, do you not do like, like tours with a bunch of shows? Just I used to, I kind of stopped there. because, um, I had a few experiences where I just, it just fucked me up. I was yeah. just like, this is way too much. I, I would like to get into doing that again. Yeah. But I want to do it like carefully, you know, like I don't, I don't think I ever want to do a 40 show tour again. Yeah. Uh, actually, I have never done. I, the biggest one I did was 35 shows. Uh -huh. And I don't think I ever want to do that again. It's It was like 35 shows in 50 days. Yeah. So it was almost every day. Yeah. Um, And it's just too much. Like it's it, doing anything like every day for that long is too much, I think. Yeah, well, I mean, just obviously in general life, like balance is good, and and yeah, I mean, I I ideally would like to just play like maybe one one or two shows a week, but you know, I'm I've been doing this like as my full time ever since I dropped out of school. I've been doing this as my full time job, and uh, and unfortunately, I'm in a position where it's like I kind of just have to do, I have to. I'm not making enough per show where I can do that. And I'm not, ver I'm terrible at like making money outside of like, I don't do merch. I'm, I'm so bad at merch. I'm so bad at, uh, releases and, and, you know, I, you know, a lot of artists do other things like teach and stuff like that. Like you do, but, um, yeah, well, I've started what I've done lately. I mean, I've been doing the teaching thing for like 10 years, but right. I've been doing other shit lately, like starting other companies. Like I started a record label and then I, I started two record labels. I started one for music and then one for samples. Oh, wow. Okay. And, um, yeah. yeah. Uh, samples are good if you want to make like extra income. Yeah. So you like, like sell them like on splice and stuff then? Uh, yeah. So I, I have like, I don't a, exactly know how that works. So basically what you do is like, you find a label that has a splice deal, uh -huh. um, like my label for instance, or any label that, that will release your stuff. And, uh, you make a sample pack, you put it on 
uh, you give it to the label and they usually will interface with Spice. It's pretty rare that like individual artists, I think, will like directly put stuff out on i mean splice have their own label and i guess people put stuff out on there but i have like a non-exclusive agreement with them where i can also just put them on on my website as well okay so i sell them like both on splice and my website okay um definitely creating like extra streams of income i think is like a smart thing to do so you don't have to do those painful tours oh totally yeah and then that way you can kind of like flex a little more i think on promoters too where you can just or you can just be like oh yeah you want me to play for like fucking 600 bucks in like you know just because it's like a big name right i'll be like fuck that i don't care <laughs> yeah that's a, i mean that's honestly that's a that's that's great like like you know i definitely get put in the position sometimes where i just have to take those gigs because yeah. like, fuck like I need, that's I need, the thing I like promoters can flex yeah. they can be like we know right. you need to do it so yeah yeah no that's that is a goal of mine definitely right now um is is i'm actually working on on a new logo right now and as soon as that's done i do want to like do merch uh you know i get hit up all the time i, I have like a, like two t-shirts basically right now out uh and uh and i i've made the design myself and it was like pretty like amateur i think um but i want to like i want to like get this new logo and like spend some money and time working with artists and like make some actual merch and stuff and and then i i've definitely like started you know, looking into like more, you know, commercial type music, stuff like that, like sample packs or, you know, making beat, like selling beats, that kind of stuff. Cause for yeah, me, totally. like it, I get the most enjoyment out of just making, making music, playing shows are really fun. I love playing shows, but definitely not that kind of a grind. Um, and so, yeah, like it would be cool to be able to not have to rely on just grinding on, on traveling, uh, for income um yeah yeah. especially like i always wonder like how sustainable it is too. like a lot of artists now who are doing music as their full-time thing who are in their like you know 20s or 30s or whatever it's like what's what's that going to look like in your 60s and 70s absolutely (laughs) because how about just like how old are you i'm 31 oh same okay yeah so i just think even like 40 like I, I, right dude, I, I think even like next year like how might like you know i got the spring tour coming up and i'm already like oh man that's gonna be a shitload of travel like it's you know it's yeah. like i'm already like thinking about that and and so well, yeah i couldn't imagine is, is like in america well in australia you have this thing called superannuation and it's uh it's a necessary fund where if you're employed by an employer they will take some of your paycheck every month and put it in a fund for you Um, So when you reach like 65 or whatever the retirement age is there, I think it's 65. Okay. uh, They just have a pool of money waiting for you that you were mandatorily paying the entire time you're working. It's like basically like our social security, right? I think the equivalent here is 401k maybe or... um, Well, 401k is not something you have to pay into. You don't have to. Yeah, that's the thing. In America, you don't have to do it. In Australia, you do. Well, that's social social security you have to pay. Oh, true. And then when you and retire, then when you, retire they, they give you money. You get you get like a yeah, you get checks. Oh, true. I, I okay, so it sounds like that then. Um, yeah, you probably does, knowing knowing your government and our government, you probably get more money than we get from Social Security. And uh, not with the we, exchange rate, but like um. Well, I'm saying like we have like serious problems with our not not to get like too like into the political side of it, but we have like serious problems with Social Security. Where like there, I've, I've been told since I was like in high school that like, by the time I retire, social security won't be there anymore. Even though I'm paying right. into it by the time I retire, like our government's just like, they okay, keep so, into that funds. I don't know. That's so American funny. DJs who are like citizens here and shit are paying social security or they should be. At least. Should be. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So you're fine. Yeah. Cause I always think about that with artists. Like, I mean, at least in my case, I don't pay social security as far as I know. I pay tax. Um, and I don't pay superannuation in Australia cause I'm not employed in Australia. Uh-huh. So like, I always wonder like, you know, what's that going to look like in later in life, you know, because yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's I mean, like one thing. Start saving. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. That's, that's another thing <laughs> I think to like sell off your studio when you're 60. <laughs> um, honestly, the studio doesn't, doesn't cost that much. Yeah. It looks expensive, but it's like the panels. I worked it out the other day. The panel, all the paneling here is like three grand. The speakers are five uh the desk is like two i mean all up like all the gear in this room is probably like 20 grand yeah yeah so it's not that bad sure I'll know, yeah i'll scale things for sure yeah i mean i've been collecting gear for a long ass time too yeah the actually most expensive thing in here that is probably the modular sure which is yeah. fucking silly 
But in general, you're, you're right that like the longevity of all this is something I definitely like think about a lot. Um, I'm actually, so I, I said I was in school, I, I dropped out. I'm actually halfway through a master's degree, uh, oh, cool. in special education teaching. Dude, nice. Awesome. Uh, so I was like on track to basically be a, a teacher and, uh, and I always say like, that's still actually my plan A like, like music is just kind of like this detour that I'm doing. Right, right. Um, you know, basically I was, I was in school, I was doing online school. Um, cause that just was like so much better for like my productivity, even though it sounds like it's not, it actually, like I go into lectures. I just like, I would just space out in every lecture and never learn anything. So I was like, you know, what, online school, just like, give me the work. Let me, give me the reading. Let me just do it. And so it actually worked out really well. So I got through my bachelor's doing that. And then I got like halfway through the masters and throughout that time I was making music and starting to really like grow as an artist. And it was always just like, it was just literally my hobby for like when I was done with schoolwork, it was just fun to work on music. But then like, I started getting like paid to play shows and, and I was, I started traveling for it. And then I got to a point where I was like, you know what? Like I could actually, well, it was, it was basically last August when I was about to start the Whittler tour. I was like, well, there's no way I can do school during the tour. So like, I have to like, at least put a hold on school I did the tour and I was like, you know what? Like I can build off this tour and probably like, you know, sustain myself financially on music right now. Um, I'll never be able to do this again in my life. I don't think if I don't just do it now. And so I, in January of last year, I, um, I dropped out of school, which was like really scary. Cause I put a ton of money into it on student loans and a, a ton of time. And a, like, I've done all these courses that I may have to redo if I ever go back. Cause you know, they changed the, 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 the curriculum. Yeah. You couldn't just get like a recognition of prior learning or whatever. So, yeah. So, the, I mean, my plan is someday to probably go back. Um, and, uh, and if, and if, and when I go back, like, yeah, like, hopefully most of those classes will, will transfer and it'll be cool. But yeah, there's a chance I might have to redo stuff, but anyways, yeah. So I just like, I was like, you know what? Like I, I want to just kind of take this opportunity and, and just enjoy it. Uh, because you know, it was never, it was never even like a goal of mine to like do this full time. Cause I didn't even like think that it was like a reality. I was like, like, I loved, I've been DJing since 2009. Like I, I love electronic music and dubstep and the whole, like playing shows is really fun. But like the idea of being like an artist that could like make money touring was just so foreign. I didn't think that like a lot of people like strive to get there. I just, it wasn't even like a possibility for me. So yeah. then when I got there, I was just like, damn, I need to like, just, do this because well i think it's it's more than possible now than ever just because electronic music in general is so big sure. like when i got i got into electronic music uh probably like 2006 or something is when i started using ableton uh -huh. um and at that time there was like not a lot of people even online talking about it yeah and there wasn't a lot of shows to go to and like there definitely wasn't a lot of ways to make money when you were in australia there yeah. too right yeah mm -hmm. so it's probably even less than it was here yeah. Speaking of shows, um, how do you go about like putting together DJ sets? Because I mean, when, when you came in here, you're looking at that. Like generally, I mean, especially for a back to back, that was a like a I'm pointing to a whiteboard for those listening. Um, that was a kill bill back to back. And the problem with, or it's not really, I guess it's a problem, um, is that when we play kill bill sets, we generally do solo sets too. So we have to know what's off the table for our solo sets before we can oh, put our solo sets together. Interesting. Yeah. So that's why we have to do this. Um, we have to figure out basically exactly the track list that we're playing for the Kill Bill set so we can put our solo sets together. Because otherwise, you know, like uh, I have a bunch of tracks on there, like originals and stuff. And it's like yeah. if I'm, I'm usually doing the solo set before the Kill Bill set and if I play them during the solo set and then we get into the to the Kill Bill set sure. and I'm like, fuck, I just did a solid set of like 70 BPM shit in my solo set and now if Chris wants to play That's all his did, 70 yeah. BPM stuff in the in the back to back it's like i got nothing left and he just has to play all his shit because now he doesn't have anything at 86 or something like that yeah i never thought about that so when i did the tour of the whittler we um probably on like a quarter or maybe even a third of the shows like we we pitched it every show we were like if like we'll do solo sets and if they want we'll do a back to back um it was either i think we agreed on either it was either going to be 70 yeah it was like either either 90 minute solo sets or 75 minute solo sets with a 30 minute back to back at the end. Right. And, uh, but the thing with that 
is that even though we do play a lot of like similar artist tunes and it's a lot of similar tunes, um, it's pretty much all 140. Yeah. Okay. I mean, it is all 140. Like we, we almost, I mean, he, I don't know if he does. I almost never play anything other than 140, which I guess sounds really like to some people that sounds like crazy. Cause I know a lot of DJs just like bounce all over the BPM range, but I find you can play a set of 140 for 90 minutes and it can be a very different 90, you know, it can, it can change through a lot throughout that 90 minutes. Um, that's a good creative limitation actually, I guess just like, yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, like I've actually never thought about it as, as a creative limitation, but like, I think at least for me producing, like I almost always start my tunes at 140, and for at least like the stuff I play out, I almost exclusively make 140. And, and, and I always joke with people. It's like, I haven't made all the 140 tunes I want to make yet. Like I just, there's still, I still come up with ideas that are different than anything else I've made. And, you know, I, what do you DJ on? Do you use CDJs? I use Ableton. Um, for the back-to-backs, I use CDJs. Okay. For my solos, I just use Ableton. Okay, so yeah. So I, I use CDJs and like, I don't know, I guess you could probably just say some of it's just laziness, but it's really nice in 140 to, to just not have to change and not really have to worry too much. Yeah. Well, and like, well, what your problem you're saying is that like, you have to worry about playing certain BPM tunes because if you do a back to back and you get into that BPM, you might've used up all the ones you wanted to play. Oh uh, yeah. And also just like a lot of the stuff I play, I think is, um, uh, not, it doesn't fall into like genres so easily sometimes. Yeah. So it's like w- when we're trying to figure out mixes, like, um, so I don't know, like, do you plan your sets at all before you play them usually? Or do you just sort of like wing it and just, I, I plan a lot. You plan yeah, a lot. I, I plan can, a lot. Yeah, me um, too. And I think like partially the reason why is because every time I don't, I'll fucking train wreck a ton of mixes just because like, well, cause know. you're jumping between BPMs. Well, I, I kind of have a formula and the formula doesn't really change. I start at 70, which uh-huh. for all intents and purposes is 140. Sure. And then I work my way up to like 72 and a half, which is kind of like 144, I guess, 145. Um, it's like that rhythm speed, basically. Yeah. And yeah. then I play all my 75 shit, which is yeah. more of the rhythm shit. That's more, yeah. And then I go from 75 to 80 and play a bunch of like 160 shit. Okay. And then I go to 86. So I basically go from like dubstep to rhythm to whatever 80 is. It's just like slightly f- somewhere between dubstep and half time time, and then more into the straight half time shit and then if i have enough time sometimes i'll play some like glitch hop at the end like 100 bpm stuff yeah so i actually (laughs) side note i actually i pretty much dj dubstep my whole life i had i got really burnt out of it in like 2011 or 12 which is actually right before i started producing that's when i got burnt out dubstep and i had like a hardcore glitch hop phase and that's when i learned about you and i used to play a ton of your music and cone sound and uh ill gates and yeah, I had like a really like deep, just hip hop, probably, or not hip hop, a uh, glitch hop, probably like a year where I just, lo- that was all I was playing in sets. And I play a little bit of dubstep. And nice. then right after that, I started making music and that's when I kind of went back to just pretty much strictly dubstep. But yeah, one nice thing about sticking with 140 though, is that like, I don't have to worry too much about w- even though I plan out my solo sets pretty straight, you know, I, it, I don't it's not that I stick to it a hundred percent, but I have a pretty, like I plan out pretty much what my set will be. I mean, actually I plan out almost down to the tune order, you know, everything, what my set will be. Um, but then like, I have the freedom to change it pretty easily because I'm just sticking in 140, and I can very quickly go from like, if it's, if it's hype and people are really into it, I can just keep going with that. And when I see that people are getting kind of tired of that, I go deeper or whatever. And I just, I can kind of feel it out all sticking within that range. And how, how often do you think like you veer from the, uh, the plan that pretty you pretty rarely pretty. Okay. Yeah. I would say more now because I'm playing a lot of shows where people like are coming to see me like mm-hmm. back when I was like, you know, opening a lot, um, you know, you're, it's much more like reading the crowd type thing. Whereas now I feel um, you know, I still want to like, I, I still want to say I'm reading the crowd, but the reality is that like, I also want to show the crowd my sound. Like I have, like, I have all these songs I've been working on. I really want to show them like, you know, it's not like it's crazy different from my normal sound. So I assume if people came to see me, they'll like them. And it's like, I want to show you everything I made. And if people aren't really feeling a tune that's like heavy and like the next one was going to be heavy, 
I'll still probably play it because like, maybe they will like that one better. And, and in general, like I try to look at my performance as just like, this is me. Like, if you don't really like this, like, I'm sorry, but like, this is kind of, you know, which is way, you know, off from what traditional DJing is. Um, but I think the more I've, uh, you know, grown as a producer versus just a DJ, like the more I've built up my catalog of sounds, like I, w I look at live sets as more like, I really just want to show what I've been making and all these songs that, uh, I'll never finish and release. <laughs> That's kind of the way I feel about sets too. It's like, if I don't specifically put a certain type of set together, um, and, and I just like wing it. It's like, yeah. sure, the set will still be fine if I win, yeah, but I'm, I works. won't play a lot of new shit because right. like, I'm going to just play whatever's going to work after the one that I'm playing. Yep. And if I don't specifically figure out a way to like quickly get between shit, then there's going to be a ton of shit at like 86 BPM that I probably won't get to or yeah. like a ton of shit at like 80 even, you know, sometimes I, if I, cause I, I kind of go between like just winging sets and then doing very specifically planned ones. And whenever I do the specifically planned ones, I'm able to sort of like, you know, get through all the tempos I want to get through right. because I've figured out ways to do that and then play all the new shit that I'm working on. Mm -hmm. But if I do the completely winging it thing, it's like fucking, I'll be lucky if I get to the 75 BPM shit. Like I'll just yeah. get stuck, like sure. sort of mixing shit and being like, fuck, I don't know how to move on. Yeah. Without yeah, like definitely. figuring out like a, yeah. Cause it's really hard to like, I mean, sure, I could try and figure it out live and be like, oh, I could probably just like work this out. But you don't want to like train wreck a mix. And then oh, yeah. you also, you know, you can think like, oh, maybe if I do this like fade to gray slash thing, like <laughs> I could maybe just like go into another thing. But I don't know there's always that doubt that like, oh, maybe that'll just be fucking horrible. So I just want to do that. Do you find it's um, harder to mix your own music on the fly? Because I have a terror, like if I'm, if I'm just like, I mean, like, like I said, I, I really haven't done it in a while, but I don't know sometimes I'll play like just smaller, like not like official gigs. I'll just, you know, play at a house, a house party or I don't know, some, some kind of event where it's not like, not really like a show. Um, and then like, I play a lot of other people's music and I can mix other people's music on the fly pretty well. And it like sounds yeah, good. And maybe cause you're not as precious about it. So you just kind of like, well, fuck it, I'm totally just going to throw another beat over this thing. That's where, totally it. Yeah. With my own songs. I'm like, no, this is how it's supposed to sound. Right. Like, <laughs> yeah. Putting anything else over it. Like sounds like I, re I really don't do double drops with my own music for that right. reason. Cause it's like, no, oh, do, like, you, do you do doubles like in your set with other people's stuff? So I listened, I've listened to a couple of your podcasts and yeah, you, was it dirt, I, I was talking with dirt Patrick monkey? about doubles. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I found that. Yeah. It was funny hearing you guys talk about that. And I still and don't really get it. Like, I didn't what? understand that some of the guys were doing like, what'd you say? Like four and Dude, six some and people eight? do four and eight. Yeah. It's fucking I, insane. Squanto yeah. does eight. Yeah. I don't, uh, that, I don't even under, I don't even know how how I could do that. I don't have I have too bad ADD for that. I think like I, I, that's too I've, much to keep track of. Yeah, since like learning about it a bit more, I, I've have pulled a few triples off in my sets. But like, I don't think I've ever done a triple. Yeah, I've done a couple, but like, it usually <laughs> it's like not three beats playing over one another. It's like one solid beat, and then another one is just like maybe a vocal thing, and oh, then I see. another yeah. one is like you know. Or maybe like the, the intro of one coming in and that's where you're at three or something. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But yeah, I mean like, but when does I was, that even count? Like, I don't think that counts unless it's three like drops playing over one another. Right. I mean, if you're trying to brag about it, tr yeah, triple drop, then yeah, you probably would. Yeah. You probably need to have the them drops. all, but you know, I, mean, I, you, I could, but like why <laughs> it would sound. Well, bad. I think the other thing is like only certain genres work like yeah. rhythms really good for that kind of stuff because totally. it's, all, you know, it's all these like quarter beats. Like it just, it, you know, works out like, you and all just, the sound design is like very similar, it's similar. Yeah. Um, whereas, you know, like, and again, maybe it's just cause I know my music so well, but you know, I, with my music, like as soon as I like bring in like a second song, then it, I feel like it's fucking with what my original idea was. And I don't want that necessarily. Yeah. If it's not like um, adding to it or something back when I was just strictly a DJ, um, I was totally about the like finding the sick double drops. Like, I mean, I think when you're, when you're purely a DJ, that's like where you get a flex basically. Like mm -hmm. that's, that's, you know, that's where you get to show off your, your skills. Um, and then, but then, yeah, the more I started making my own music, I think I just like, I, I didn't feel like I needed to like show off anything. And I, and I just, I realized like if a song's not sounding good enough on its own, go back to the studio and make the song better. You know, like <laughs> yeah. if, if the drop isn't, you know, Built the double into the song. 
<laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, and, and like, not to like, like tie it into like, not to hate on the guys that do the like one, two, three, you know, you know, building up the crowd thing. Cause like, I think that's like definitely cool in the right setting, but I always go like, if you need to like hype up your drop more than it already is, then like go back and make that drop more hype. You know, it's like, I, I kind of yeah. just think the music needs to do the work. I feel that, but also like, um, I mean, I, I never get on the mic. I yeah. used to like a little bit and then uh -huh. I had like a few bad experiences with it. And I was like, you know, what, fuck that. What do you mean by bad experience? Just saying stupid shit. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't want to get into it. But like, okay. <laughs> basically I got on the mic once and was talking about like, I was on MDMA oh, and I was okay. talking okay. about like all sorts of incorrect shit. Okay. And, <laughs> yeah, that's um, okay. And, I, and I'm glad that it happened a long time ago. Otherwise there might be videos of that on the internet. And yeah, it would be the kind of shit that if people seen it they'd be like that's super questionable okay it was, well, it was pretty fucked i mean dr drugs yeah get weird yeah um, it was bad so like um so i haven't touched a mic basically since then oh so you, you do you do like at least like hey i'm mr bill no or, i don't at all really? do no i walk wow. on stage i play and i leave i don't okay. talk at all yeah i mean i i know yeah guys guys do that i feel but but here's the thing it's yeah. like i don't hate on people that do like uh -huh. when, whenever i see someone who's doing like the one two three thing like mm -hmm. jumping on a table and stuff um I'm like, yeah, it's fine. I mean, like, it's, it's just part of the performance, right? Like, it's, you know, hype, hyping people up and being a bit of a cheerleader or whatever. Yeah. It's like, it seems fine. I don't have a problem with it. I just, it's not for me personally. And yeah. Due I, to I, I wouldn't say, like, I, I hate on it necessarily. Like, I, I, and I, I think I think some people do it really well. Like, I've definitely seen totally. some artists where it's like, yeah, that was sick. Yeah, like, like Opio, was, man. He crushes it. I haven't seen him in a while. He, I saw him a long time ago. He was another glitch hop guy. I used to love playing. Yeah, yeah he's hypey as fuck. Is he? He's great okay. at it. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, and then the really opposite well. of that is like some people, like um, I guess Cohen Sound, right? Like mm -hmm. they make hypey ass music. Right. But like when they were getting on the mic, when I saw them play, I was like, oh, they're kind of like you can't really like Dirt Monkey talked about this in the podcast we did too. It's like you can't really get on the mic and talk. Like you need to like yell. Right. And you need to be like hypey about it or it seems weird. Like it's very weird to just be like, hi guys. Um, here well, you to, have, like, play you have to have like a tight package of what you're going to say yeah. and, and get it out. You can't just, yeah, you can't let people like, okay, well, what's he like? Where's he going with this or something? Right. Exactly. Uh, yeah. I always love how space Jesus does it. He just kind of drops in like little tiny, like anecdotes and quips and just do you reckon he like keep thinks heavily about those like do you think that's like part of his set prep he don't just... forget to recycle guys or something like that i just think that's uh like do, do, you think do i think just, he practices what do you think it? he uh, just like thinks of that shit on the spot i don't really know him that well i mean like you know we've like you know met a couple times had a few shows but uh yeah i don't i don't know him well enough to say if like it's something he like thinks about i the way that i view it is just like he probably is just you know, he, he knows there's a breakdown coming up and there's going to be kind of a gap and he just kind of thinks of something on the spot, kind of funny to say. And, and I don't know, I, I just think it's, it's, it's kind of a funny thing to hear. Um, and it's, and it's tasteful. It's not like he's like talking over the whole set, you know, he's just, it's just like times when the music's died down and there's a little bit of a, like kind of people waiting for the next drop or something. He just puts in a little quip and I think that can be funny. The only one that really like starts to bother me is when it's just like every single drop, the person's on the mic yelling and screaming. And it's not even like that. I don't like, like them as a person for doing it. It's more just like. I want to hear, I want to hear the buildup and the drop. Like, I, like just yeah, from yeah. a musical perspective, like if, if right. I'm in the crowd, like I'd like to hear how the song was meant to be heard. Yeah. And that's why I made that comment of like, if the drop's not good enough, go back and make it better. Cause I just, you know, when I'm in the crowd, like I'm totally down to like, you know, hear the DJ's thoughts and, you know, occasionally like, you know, hype up the crowd or something, but it's like the main thing I want to hear is your music. But you could also argue that like, if you need to introduce yourself at the start of the set, then you should just make your visuals better, right? Oh, checkmate, you got me. <laughs> yeah, um, but I don't think that's the case either. I, well, think I don't. Like, I don't. I, I don't. I've never done like custom visuals. I've, I've always just right. sent them. Yeah, my, well, it's expensive. Send them. My it's definitely logo. much cheaper to put just up my be logo like, and spin it around in circles or whatever you want to do with it. That's the way to do um, it. Yeah. Yeah. Honestly, I do it more as just like a. Honestly, probably like the main thing. I want to get on the mic for is just to like shout out the DJ that played before me mm. just as like someone who spent years opening. It just always felt nice when the headliner was like, Hey, give it up for, you know, push loop, like, you know, whoever's, you know, like, so I just, when I get on, I want to make sure whether I'm a headliner or whether I'm like support or, you know, whether I'm an opener at like a really big show, like if there's someone before me, I still want to just like shout them out. It's just like, Hey, give it up for so-and-so. And I always like, 
get on my phone like right before I, you know, get up there and make sure I know who it is. And um, just because I think that's kind of like just a respectful way to, you know, a lot of DJs don't want to talk at the end of set. Like if I was, you know, playing after you, you, you didn't want to say anything. I, I'd like to give you a, hey, like Mr. Bill, you know, give it up one time, you know, so right, like, right. Um, and then after that, there's like an awkward pause if I don't say anything. So then I just go, I'm push loop, like, you know, <laughs> let's do this or yeah. let's get weird or something like that. And, and, True. and then maybe I'll like, maybe like halfway through the set, if it's just like, um, if there's like a big transition that gets a little slow or I don't know, some, maybe I'll like say like, maybe I'll say like, here's like a brand new one. You're the first to hear this. And that's not even like supposed to be a flex. It's more just like, Hey, this is like some brand new shit. Like, you know, you know, I, you know, let me know what you think, I guess. I don't know. I don't know why I say it, but maybe so people know, you know, a lot of people ask for IDs and stuff. And so that's why I want to like, I don't know, shout out certain tunes, whether if it's a friend's tune who just sent me, um, like I think last night, the only shout out I, I did, is like halfway through the set, I dropped this new Thelum and on L tomb and I just like, well, oh, like, dude, hey, some, sick. yeah, I was just like, Hey, like new Thelum, you know, just like, is he Denver based though? Uh, he lives in LA. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah um, great. So, but yeah, so like, and then at the end of the set, just, uh, you know, thanks for everything. And yeah, I guess, I don't know, maybe, maybe I'll stop saying my name, but I just, I, you know, I feel like it's it's worth saying just, you know, the thing is a lot of people at shows, you know, especially like festivals can be so fucked up. They don't even know who's playing. So it's more just like, Hey, if you're curious, That's this true. is push loop, like just so you know, like, but also <laughs> like, yeah, I, I feel that too. But also like my other thought is like, fuck it. Like if they like the set, they'll figure it out. Like, if, yeah. And that, and yeah, in prob- that sense, it's like, sure. if they go to the effort to kind of be like, who the fuck was that? And like, think yeah. about it a bunch. It kind of like gets in their head more, I think. Interesting. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, hard to say though, because uh, probably a lot of people are just don't give a shit, and they're just like, you know what? I didn't know who it was, and I can't be fucking bothered figuring it out. So who cares? And like, don't become a fan. I don't know how often that's happening though. Yeah, I mean, so I don't, I don't know about you. Like, I don't really like. Well, I don't take drugs at shows anymore. Um, Me either. Yeah. Like ba- back when I was younger and getting into it, I definitely was into that. And I don't know. I went to a lot of festivals where like. I would look at like a stage and see like a few artists in a row who I liked and I would just go park myself at that stage and um, wouldn't really care necessarily who was playing at the time. I would just, if the music was good, I'd stick around. It was and more just about like the festival. It was more just about, yeah, the festival experience. And, you know, back then, like just experimenting with drugs and, and just kind of like having fun partying. And, and then the older I got, the more I just kind of like, lost interest in that but then now when i go to those shows i always think that yeah there's probably some people there that are like that where they're just they have no idea even where they are what planet they're on or something you know but Um, at the end yeah and i forget sometimes if that's the case though they're like don't even know what planet they're on it's like are they really going to become a fan at that moment oh absolutely not yeah no (laughs) yeah me saying push leap means nothing at that point yeah Yeah, i guess no you're right you're absolutely right like what what's a push (laughs) what's a yeah right then i'm just yeah. (laughs) yeah totally uh yeah i don't know um but whatever okay yeah, man well sweet it was really good talking to you man dude likewise man yep. yeah and, uh, thanks for coming on yeah and, thanks uh, for having is there me, anything dude. you want to plug uh you got dates in the spring with the widler i have one show sioux city iowa for uh december 21st that's my last show of the year right. and then yeah the big tour with the widler we uh we should be announcing the first phase of dates uh just after new year's like beginning of the year nice. and keep an eye out and hopefully come to your city and yeah thank okay, you, man. Uh, thanks for having me man of course man thank you thank you for listening to the mr bill podcast thank you for listening to the mr bill podcast